right, guys. I think we'll get started. It's already uh, seven minutes past three. I sorry to keep you waiting. Dodzy was supposed to be on here seven minutes ago, so I don't know what's holding him up. But um, since you're here, I don't want to waste your time, and I, I figure we'll get started. So, my name's Ben. I'm the founder of Coach, which is a heart rate training program that helps you to optimize, track, and enjoy your training. I'm a Kiwi, but I'm currently based in Singapore. And so, uh, unlike you guys dealing with winter, I'm sitting up here sweating like crazy because it's about 32 degrees. Um, I want to say thank you for joining us. The idea of today was to talk you guys through race execution. Now, you've got your marathon or half marathon coming up next weekend. And the hope of today is that we, we plant some seeds that hopefully you'll take on board and let grow. And next week, the goal is that you maximize your fitness on race day. So in case you don't know my background, I was um, in my former life a professional triathlete like, like Tony. We actually had the same coach and um, I raced the World Cup series as well. My last race ended up being the Beijing Olympic trials at the end of 2007, after which I, I got a severe case of dengue fever and um, that pretty much brought my racing career to an end. So. I packed up, I moved to Singapore because I like the weather and um, I started a fitness lab here. And so for the past 10 years, I've been operating a, a fitness lab where we do VO2 max testing, lactate testing, uh, a fat burning test, sweat testing and that kind of thing. And um, as a result of doing an absolute bunch of testing, um, we have a lot of data and we've slowly refined our philosophy and our training programs out of that. So I've spent the last 10 years in the lab, either testing or observing and um, refining our programs as we go along. So I don't want to talk too much about our programs. Um, what I will say is if you, if you hang in there and you listen on, I'll offer you a code to, to give you a six week free trial of our program. So obviously not going to be of use for this race, but definitely for your next race, um, you can try that out, take our program for a, for a spin run and see what you think. Um, we've had a lot of success here, uh, helping people qualify for Boston, run faster, stay injury free, whatever it is their, their goal. And um, I'm pretty confident if you have the confidence to apply what we teach, because it's not always um, intuitive, uh, there's a high chance you'll, you'll have a good result. So with that in mind, I talked to you today through that lens. I talked to you as someone who's done a hell of a lot of training in my past life. And um, now someone more recently who has been a full-time professional coach for the last 10 years, uh, working with thousands of people in Singapore and around the world. Um, there's lots of ways to skin a cat. Our way is just one. Um, but I believe in it full-heartedly because we have the data to back it up. And it's just very evidence-driven. Now, with your race so close, there's not a whole lot we can help you with from a fitness point of view. Um, your fitness is hopefully good because you've spent the last few months training and doing your best to maximize that fitness. But if it's not, the goal is still to get the most out of the fitness that you have. And one of the very interesting observations that I learned early in my career and just watching athletes who have been in our lab was that <clears throat> fitness actually takes a backseat to execution on race day. Now, what, what's been super interesting is that I've known people are fit because I, a lot of the time we'll test person, people on a Monday or a Tuesday in our lab just to, to check their fitness uh, before they go into the race and to refine their strategy if we need to. And I know that a person is fit because we do lactate testing and it, it shows us that. And what was happening a lot in the early days was race result was coming in and it wasn't matching the fitness that we were seeing. And that was a bit of a head scratcher for me. I hadn't really given race execution a whole lot of thought at that point. Um, the racing that I always did was very tactical. And I, I guess the execution part was just intuitive. So um, I had to sort of ask a lot of questions. I started diving into to the splits and I started to going to all the races here in Singapore and just watching how people um, were executing their race and, and doing um, – using their pacing strategy and things like that. And it became very clear that the issues weren't in their fitness. The issue was in how they were applying the fitness on race day and how they were executing their race. Now, to give you a practical example of this, I, I was coaching a couple of Aussie guys. And this is 
I don't know, five, about five, six years ago. And they're both pretty fit guys, both around a, a three hour marathon sort of fitness. And they were running the New York marathon. And so they're in our lab, I think it was about a week before um, that race. And they are both in their late at the time. I think one guy was about 46, 47. The other guy would just turn 50. Um, both Australian, both fit guys, like I mentioned. And their lactate thresholds came in and they were very, very similar. The younger guy had a slightly better threshold. Um, and I thought he would run a good one to two minutes maybe over the marathon faster than the, than the older guy. Um, I was very surprised when the results came in and they were very different. Now, the older guy had run just on three hours, like three hours and change. The younger guy, who should have theoretically gone a minute or two quicker, ran three hours 18. Now, that's a pretty big difference in timing, yet it had nothing to do with fitness. And that pretty much illustrates the whole idea that I'm trying to put across. Um, race day is about maximizing fitness. And you choose to execute well, or you choose to let ego get in the way and the other circumstances that play a role get in the way. And sometimes you don't maximize the fitness that you have. So it turned out the, the younger guy, he had gone through the half marathon in a significantly faster time than the older guy. Uh, basically, he just started too fast. And as a result of that, he burned his fuel too fast. He fatigued his muscles too fast. He produced too much lactate and these types of things. And he couldn't sustain the pace and he slowed down quite dramatically on the back end. So that was a shame for him. Whereas if you look at the splits from the older guy, he had done everything perfectly, pretty much older and wiser, I guess you could say. But he started conservatively and gradually as the race unfolded, he got faster and faster and faster. And he finished um, with a very subtle negative split. So that's what we want to do. And I want to be the little voice in your head next week telling you to be conservative. Now, on race day, there's a, a few circumstances that don't play to your favor. Um, ideally, you've been doing some training, right? And for the past few weeks, because of the volume and, and, and just the, the sheer toughness of the work you've been doing, it's likely that you um, have been training on heavy legs and have never really felt too great. Now, ideally you should have been tapering off and um, should be fresh. So on race day, it's the first time in, in ages that you've felt fresh. And as a result, it's likely that you're feeling pretty eager to go out and test that fitness. And so that's the first circumstance that makes racing a challenge. The second is that your body gets pumped full of adrenaline. So the atmosphere, the thousands of people around you, the music beating, all that kind of stuff, um, raises adrenaline, raises heart rate, gets you excited, and that tends to, to cause you to run out harder than you should. Um, on top of that, it's likely that you're gonna be surrounded by a whole bunch of other Muppets who also don't know what they're doing, and they run out too fast. And so that gives you a false sense of how hard you're working and it suckers you into running a pace above what your current fitness is gonna support for the length of the race. And um, obviously none of that is ideal if you wanna maximize your fitness. So the whole idea of what we're gonna be talking today about is the things that you can do to maximize your fitness on race day because there's nothing more we can do from a training point of view. Um, you've got a week and a half left to race day and your fitness is not going to get any better between now and then, unfortunately. If you do make some silly mistakes, though, you can make your fitness worse. And so we're going to talk a little bit now about race day because Dodsy's been kind enough to grace us, you slack bugger. Um, and so Tony and I will now chat. I, I encourage you that if you have any questions as we go through this, please, there's a little chat icon somewhere on the bottom of the screen. Just hit chat, post up any questions that you have and either Dodsy or myself will be very happy to answer your questions and to give you um, some last minute advice that hopefully will help you. Now, Tony, can you hear me all right? 
Yep, mate, you got there. You can everyone hear me? So I had a little personal emergency, but I'm back. I'm done it. So <laughs> we're all good. Right. Leave <laughs> yeah. me hanging, dude. <laughs> yeah. well, anyway, glad to see you, man. Um, yeah. I've just been filling these guys in on the importance of race execution. And yeah. you're a person that's raced at a, at a pretty high level, represented New Zealand at the Olympic Games and two Commonwealth Games. And you're someone who I believe should know how to execute pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one too because, and you know, most of my cases, I'm really fit. You get up, you, you do all the work, you, you train your heart out, and then some things you can do the race on the race week can just stuff it up, um, like overthinking, um, nutrition, doing too much. I mean, two weeks out from the race now, just, um, under, uh, just over a week from now, there's nothing more you can do to get fitter or to get better from now until the race, but you can um, diminish your race by doing something too hard or too fast right now or doing too, too much. So now it's just about fine tuning, um, doing those little things right, eating well, keeping hydrated, um, and not overthinking what you want to do, you know. Let the training, what you've been doing, take care of itself. Um, you've obviously been training quite well and, and um, you know, doing all the fitness. So let that show in the race and not, you know, it's a simple, you're just running, but just do not overthink it. Let that let that training be put into the race. So yeah. yeah, that's good advice, man. So I think how how do people do that? At the end of the day, um, my take on this is that you want to forget about the result. A lot of people um, get hung up on running a goal time, and that lends itself to wanting to take shortcuts. Um, there are things we can control on race day, and there are things we can't. Obviously, we can't control the weather. Um, we can't control the course that Dion has created. We can influence some things. We can influence our competitors and the people around us. We can't control them, though. But there are things we can control, and those are the things that become important between now and uh, race day, right? Um, things like your equipment choices, what you wear, things like how you choose to use this thing, manage your mind. You, you choose whether to be in a positive or a negative frame of mind and you choose how to respond to things that happen, um, good and bad, between now and race day and on race day. Um, you are in control of your running form and, and how that breaks down or doesn't break down as you get tired. You're in control of your pacing and your nutrition. So I think for the remainder of this talk, mate, should we just go through each of those things one at a time and... Um, yeah talk a little bit about those let's start with the equipment stuff because um it's important that you pick the right gear and that you don't make any mistakes around gear i'm sure you have and i know i have made some pretty big stuff up yeah one of the biggest things i recommend right now in terms of gear is i mean if you've been training in shoes do not in the shoes you've been training for the last few months, do not change them. You don't want to go out there and change your shoes and all of a sudden get blisters or, or get an injury, you know, 5K into it. You know, don't change those little things or don't um, specifically take a gel um, or something that you haven't tried before um, or another drink that you haven't tried. You know, on the, the race course, they may have some other drink that you're not used to. Uh, they might have Coca-Cola out there that you haven't not you normally been, you know, doing during training. So don't change those little things. Um, yeah, so that's as far as I go is with, with gear. I mean, there's not much. It's, it's running. It's 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 uh, running shoes. But um, yeah, apart from shorts and a t-shirt, really. <laughs> For sure, man. Now, <clears throat> that's great advice. And that's the first thing that I recommend to all our athletes as well is never do anything new on race day. It's a recipe for um, not getting the best out of yourself. Now, sometimes you get lucky and it, there's no negative effect. But a lot of the time, you'll... You know, you change some gear, you end up with some chafing, you end up with a blister. Um, none of that stuff is productive and it's completely within your control. And so making those mistakes is a silly thing. Um, another thing I'll comment on, and I don't know how, how you approach this, mate, but I, um, I always used to work to a checklist. So I try to get everything out of my head and limit the mistakes that my silly little brain can make. And I always... Uh, Used to work to a checklist, know all the gear that I needed to take to the race, check it off, put it in the bag, make sure that it's there. Um, yeah. Because yeah. I have turned up to a race, needed a timing chip or a pair of shoes or my goggles. Um, 
and went to get them and realized they weren't there. Yeah. Have you ever had that situation? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, people would say to me, you know, use a checklist and that. Um, but it takes the, the guessing out of it. Once you're there and you've got your checklist and you've got everything down, you don't need to worry about anything else. You've got it all. Um, so that's, you know, that's good. Yeah. Exactly. And I think, you know, part of race morning and, and controlling the controllables is um, keeping stress down, right? One of the worst things you can do for your race is forgetting something and then instantly that, that pumps you full of adrenaline and cortisol and um, raises your heart rate. And as soon as you raise your heart rate, especially if it's if it's a bit, you put yourself on the back foot right from the start, and um, that's a real shame. So I encourage everybody to work to a checklist. I've actually written a blog about why checklists are useful, and um, even put one up on our blog. So do visit coach.fitness/blog and scroll down, and you'll see a a blog there about checklists with a downloadable checklist that you can use. And I, I strongly encourage you to do it because. Um, you don't want to forget anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> How's the weather there at the moment, out of curiosity? Um, well, I'm in Dunedin. <laughs> it's cold. That's cold. Uh, All right. Not sure, what, um, not sure what Auckland's like. Um, I heard a different thing. Fresh I mean, too. Probably a little bit warmer than here. So, um, yeah. I'm still... Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what time it is going to be in the morning. It's probably going to be about 9 a.m., I'd say, um, for the half or the full. Um, so it will be a little bit chillier. But yeah. you know, as the day goes on, it's going to get it's going to get warmer. So wear the appropriate wear the appropriate gear. Yeah, I think in in, in my experience, um, it's always good to be warm to start with, and then mm. as you run, de-layer. So you want to have on some old gear on top that you can either get rid of, or that you can take off and tie around your waist or something like that. Because there's nothing nothing worse than than feeling cold and miserable, um, because more yeah, likely than not. I yeah. wear like um, um, uh, uh, tracksuit pants. I wear tracksuit um, jacket. Even if it is hot, I always do it. I always wear it just so I can get my muscles warmed up before a race. My Achilles and calves are a little bit tight. And so I, I would wear, like even now, I still wear tracksuit pants when I'm running, like all through, even through spring, um, autumn. I only jump into my um, shorts uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to summer and probably gets over about 18 degrees. So... Um, that just keeps my muscles warm before a big event. So I would suggest just warming up in tracksuit pants just so you can, or tights just so you can get your muscles warm and then, yeah. Cool, man. All right. So <clears throat> that's equipment. The basic number one rule of equipment is don't try anything new. Mm. Yeah? yeah? All right. So let's move on to mindset, mate. Tell us a little bit about how um, you try and – control your mind and, and get in the right frame of mind so that you can uh, maximize your your race day uh, i know you, you've had a struggle with this right think, yeah i think we're both probably the same when you were, in, we when are. You were trying to as well our minds just go crazy you know thinking of the what ifs what if this happens what if that happens am i good enough am i going to be good enough am i going to get a pb those are all the questions you want to know um but only over the last, I've been doing it for, I was doing it for 13 years, but only the last two or three years, I mean, I had to start meditating to be able to calm my mind down. Um, but with one week to go, look, um, obviously even checklists for this can be really good. Um, have I done everything I could to prepare for this race? Um, if I have, there's nothing to worry about. If I haven't, we well, can't do anything now. So, <laughs> you know, you can't worry about that. Um, but yeah, the mind is going to play a big part, especially with the, with with the week leading up. That's the biggest thing. Um, the things that I would do was just keep myself busy. I think outside of it, so I would have a a routine. Um, the week leading up, I would make myself go do things, make myself go have a coffee, make myself go um, go out for lunch with a friend and talk about not triathlon or in this case maybe not running. Um, just keep yourself busy before that. You know, before the event. Even have a, like a little routine where you need to go through the day before so that you're not actually sitting around. The worst thing I, f I found was that sitting around was what made me more um, nervous and, and, and think a lot. So just keep yourself busy. And, um, um, yeah, if you can't control it, then there's no point worrying about it. For sure, man. I, I think um, you and me were in the same boat. Like, yeah, it's very easy to get inside your head. And uh, that's largely also because we had the time to sit around. I think a lot of the people that are listening to this will likely have a job and maybe some kids and some other things 
fighting for their attention. So it should be a little easier for them to hopefully stay positive and uh, just look forward to the experience. I think too, from a from a mindset point of view, the goal is um, on race day to try and stay positive. Now, it's not always, you know, shit happens. Um, <clears throat> and it's not always possible, possible to stay completely positive. But as a worst case, um, you at least want to be neutral, right? In my experience, performance goes down as soon as you start to think about how much you suck and how much oh, it yeah. hurts. Yeah. And so there's little tricks that you can do to um, train the mind. I, I think uh, one of the cool little things that I learned um, working with my mental conditioner was um, a thing called body checks. I don't know if you've ever tried this, Tony, but it's, it's pretty effective, man. The, the whole idea is to, it's just to help trick the mind when things start to go wrong. So for example, you guys have probably experienced this. You're running along, you start to get this annoying little blister on your little toe and it's tiny and it doesn't really affect your ability or it shouldn't affect your ability to run well. But the way the mind is structured, because it hurts, all your attention goes to your stupid little toe and you just start thinking about how much it hurts and then you start to compensate um, and then other things start to hurt and then you think, oh my gosh, this sucks. And you, you draw yourself into this negative sort of potentially draw yourself into this negative frame of mind, um, which is obviously not productive and helping you keep moving forward. So a cool little trick that I learned was something called body checks where um, if you find yourself in that situation, either with chafing somewhere or a blister or whatever, you divert the mind. So say your little toe is getting a blister and it's painful. You go up and you go, how's my hair? Yeah, my hair's good. How's my right <laughs> eyebrow? Yeah, my right eyebrow's good. How's my left eyebrow? And you just start to get very detailed on things that, um, are at the opposite end of the body. Because what's interesting is your mind can only think about one thing at a time. And so if you're thinking about your eyebrows or your nice uh, facial hair there, um, <clears throat> and you go through it in detail, it stops you thinking about your silly little toe. Um, and in my experience, it works very well for, for managing pain and for keeping moving forward. Um, as best you can. I don't know if you've tried any tricks like that, Dodzy, but it yeah, works pretty well. A, yeah, no, that is no, it's a very good um, one. I, well, keep my mind off the pain was probably one of, one of the things, but that's the that's a real good yeah, that's a real good um, advice to give. Yeah, it's a good little trick. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> another thing is, and we'll touch on pacing in a minute, but one, another good thing that fuels um, mindset is executing well because when you do execute well. You're the guy or the girl who is passing everybody in the back end of the race rather than the, the person that started too fast, blew up, and is having everyone pass them. And so I think when you, you apply what we teach you today and you execute well and you are the strong person in the back end of the race, um, while it will still hurt because you're pushing yourself, you will be the person fueling off everyone else's suffering. And in my experience, it's a very nice thing to run past and draw energy from all the people that are that are hurting worse than you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I was always one that went out a bit harder and um, paid the price in the, in the end because I always wanted to win. But um, no, it's definitely a better feeling going a little bit steady at the start and, and coming home very strongly. Um, yeah. If you want to get more technical into, into pacing and that, I have told some of my athletes, I said, look, if you want to do a half Ironman, and um, you have a pace, say you want to go five minute K pace for the half iron, uh, the half marathon. I would say for the first five kilometers, go 510, 515 pace. Um, then for that next 10 kilometers, you want to go, five, you want to sit back on your pace at five minutes or just under five minutes. Um, and then the last, you know, last five, six, seven K, then you can notch it up all you want. Just gives you a little bit of buffer, but um, gives you a little bit of pacing advice as well. So always, um, instead of just sticking to five minute K pace the whole time, the only way you can really go is is backwards, you know, from the second half. So even just you're holding back a little bit from what you really want to pace, and then and then bringing it home. That's the best thing for about a half marathon, a half Ironman, or a marathon as well. So yeah, for sure. And so let's let's touch on that now, right? Since you've brought it up, let's talk on pacing because. 
Pacing, in my opinion anyway, is the single most important thing to get right on race day when it comes to execution, because it also affects nutrition. Um, <clears throat> if you start too fast, you also burn your fuel at a higher rate and your body has only enough glycogen in the muscles and the liver to fuel itself at marathon pace for around 90 minutes. Um, if you burn that up even faster, then you become even more reliant on the gels and the sports drinks and stuff to, to get your energy. And so pacing is important. And um, there's three essential, well, three, three pacing strategies most people can choose to do. The first is known as a positive split, meaning you run the first half a bit faster than the second half. And you've done that a lot, Tony, so have I. Well, um, that, that is not the best strategy. <laughs> Um, but it, it's the default strategy. Like if you could look at any marathon um, stats from around the world and uh, look at the percentage of people who ran the first half faster than the second half, I don't know what it would be, but it would be well over 85% in pretty much every marathon, I would imagine. Um, because we all have an ego. Um, because of those circumstances I mentioned earlier, we all start too fast. We all get tired. We all slow down. That's not the best way to express your fitness, though. The next is um, an even split. And for runners, it's a very good strategy to, to, to run the first half um, the same as the second half, essentially. And I think I always reference now the Elliot Kipchoge running at the, the Breaking 2 Nike run. Did you guys see that? Yeah. yeah. That was pretty interesting because, um, you know, it was a very laboratory type of setting and I had a Tesla with lasers shooting off the back of it, setting the, the pace, they had paces and everything. But Nike spent millions and millions of dollars um, putting that together, trying to break that two hours, and he fell short by 20-something seconds. But the strategy that they employed for him and that he ran was an even split. Like, I don't think he had more of a variation in pace across the 42 kilometers than two seconds. Like, that's pretty freaking impressive. Um, and I think the reason they chose that strategy is just because it, it burns everything more evenly. Um, and so you can better control your nutrition and, and things like that. So, uh, you know, I, th I think that's a good strategy for most of you listening. That, that's a good strategy to try and do. If you can run your second half as fast as your first half um, and you feel knackered, like completely knackered at the end, uh, then that's likely you, you maximize your fitness and, and run a really smart and strong race. The last the time, time, I think, you, sorry, sorry, I think most of the time you actually feel like you've tried to run the second half faster than the first half, but the times are probably going to be the same anyway. For sure, yeah, yeah. because if you hold, you know, pace relatively steady, um, effort is still going up, right? Because you, you fatigue, the muscles break down, you're accumulating lactate, you're dehydrating, and so on, right? So effort will always go up, and even if pace is um, pretty even. The last is, if you can do it, is a negative split. So you'll see a lot of the elite runners will run a very subtle negative split a lot of the time, meaning that their second half is a fraction faster than their first half. If you can make that happen, um, that's very well done. It's, it's, it's not so easy to achieve. But I think um, on race day, like, let Tony and I be the little voice in your head saying, Slow down, slow down, slow down, at least for the first few K, just yeah. so that you can find your feet, keep your heart rate down um, and ease your way into it because you should feel like you're building your effort the entire 21 or 42 K. Yeah, yeah. Anything else you have to comment on in regards to pacing? No, no, yeah. I mean, you can, guys can do whatever you want for the last 5 K, but yeah, I'd suggest, <laughs> suggest that that definite first half is just to always feel like you have, you know, some left in the tank to be able to notch it up another gear for that second half. Yeah. For sure. And, we, and we're making it sound pretty easy, like it's an easy thing to do. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, a lot yeah, of I people... Feel like, I feel like easy on, at this side of the old... Um, <laughs> on this side of the stage now, telling people what to do <laughs> rather than actually doing it. I always found it quite hard doing it. But, um, yeah, you know, I feel, feel easy telling people to, to do it now. But just... I, mean, I suppose learn from our experiences a little bit more too. But I think too, mate, knowing what to do and actually doing it are two different things. Like everyone knows how to be lean and skinny, right? Just don't eat McDonald's, don't eat your, your crappy foods. But knowing it and doing it are, are two different things. And so 
Um, I think it's fair that even if you have stuffed it up, that you're in a position to sit there and say, you know, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> um, cool. So a lot of people think that to run faster in a race, they need to run faster, for example. Um, you know, part of running a faster time is not necessarily running faster, it's slowing down less, right? Because in your racing, Tony, you guys get off the bike and you run 240 through the first K and mm -hmm. it's not the fastest person who wins, but the person who slows down the least, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. So with that in mind, let's talk about running form because running form plays a pretty major role in how much you slow down. Um, ideally, when you run, you, you want to be relatively tall. You want to have your chin up, head up over the shoulders, shoulders over the hips, hips over the ankles, nice tilt forward from the, from the ankles, right? Um, and that allows you to maximize your stride length and to run pretty well. Now, <clears throat> you guys have probably experienced this, right? But as you fatigue, what do most people tend to do? Drop the chin, yeah. drop the chin. And having watched literally hundreds of races, um, it's very interesting seeing people at the back end of a marathon because the ones who are running well, they typically have got their chin locked in, they're driving, you know, they look, they look good, nice and tall, they're well postured. Um, the rest of them have got their chin down and they're hunched forward. And this is an issue because the head is very heavy, right? And when you drop your chin, and the weight of your head starts to pull you forward, it shortens your hip flexors, shortens your stride length. And so as soon as your stride length is shortened, you are slower, right? Because if cadence is the same and stride length shortens, you're, you're slower. Um, and so one of the things that I've found um, through, you know, through my own running races and things, but also through coaching people to do this, is that keeping your head up and just being conscious of where your chin is um helps to delay the rate at which you fatigue and your running form falls apart and if you can do that you will run a better time because you will slow down less what sort of things were you thinking about when you used to race dodgy from a form point um, of view yeah when things when things got tough and i knew that i was losing form um i'd just go back to cues um right hips up head up um not wobbling around too much and they were just simple, simple cues. Just, yeah, my, my, my main thing was just hips, just hips, keeping hips straight, keeping them aligned, and not wobbling your upper, upper body too much. And when that happened, I mean, it sometimes wasn't as fast as I wanted it to be, but it was as fast as I could go at that certain stage. So, yeah, have a little cues and, and focus on those things when things start to get tired. Yeah. For sure, man. Also, too, another good thing that, you know, that I, I used to do too is like, when you are tired and your legs feel like they weigh 100 kilos each, um, putting some focus on your arms and starting to be a bit more aggressive with your arm movement can help, right? Because it's, it's very hard to speed up your arm carriage and then not have your legs follow. So that's not a sustainable strategy most of the time because eventually they'll tire out as well. But if you sometimes need a, a short burst or you want a change of rhythm, um, try bringing in your arms and being a little bit more aggressive with your arms and your legs will follow. All right, man. So let's touch on the last point that people can control on race day, and that is what they choose to fuel with their nutrition strategy. Um, you've always raced short course triathlon, so you probably haven't had to worry too much about what you take on board. Um, but when you run a marathon, you most definitely do. Tell us a little bit about how you used to fuel um, prior to a race and during a race. Me, well, yeah, this is very different because nutrition plays a massive part in um, half marathons, marathons, half Ironmans, um, Ironmans, etc. Um, so it didn't necessarily play a massive part. And if anyone knew Bevan Doherty, then you probably know that he was he was pretty bad with his nutrition. You know, um, even Chris Gemmel, you know, they just eat whatever because it was only a short race. But as the time's going on, more professional um, eating becomes a big part. Um, I always used to go for a, a bowl of porridge and some eggs on top for a bit of protein. Um, that used to be my that used to be my go-to um, and fluids beforehand as well. But 
coming into a race, race morning, I think probably about 50% of my races, I hated eating. Like I couldn't, I had to really force myself to eat. Um, so you may just have to do that. Um, just make sure that you're having something that you've always had before. Um, don't go out and change it. Don't go and, you know, have a big bacon and eggs and, and hash browns if you haven't, you, you're not usually having it. So keep it something sim simple, some, um, you know, some good protein fats um, and something that you usually, you usually have. But in this lead up, just remember to eat clean. Um, no massive, you know, deep fried fatty foods. Um, you don't need to lose weight either. You don't need to go on a big salad diet either, but just eat some whole foods. Uh, make sure it's clean and and yeah, make sure you get the fluids up. But you'll have a lot more um, um, a better idea than me being about um, with with half half marathons and marathons. So yeah, <laughs> I'll leave that one to you. <laughs> All right, man. Well, again, nutrition is a is a it's a it's a hard thing because everyone has um, is, is made differently and everyone has a different. Um, fat burning ability everybody has different um, food preferences or flavor preferences everybody has different sweat rates and um, sodium concentration of sweat and these things all influence like theoretically how how you need to fuel right now i'm in the camp of believing that if you can become fat adapted that is a very good thing because you then sir um you burn glycogen less or at a slower rate and uh, become less reliant on the, the sports drinks and the products. Um, I'm also a believer of splitting up um, calories and hydration. So a traditional sports drink, your Gatorades, your Powerades, um, those types of drinks uh, are trying to address everything. They're trying to address energy uh, or calories. They're trying to address hydration. And... Um, <clears throat> there's not a whole lot of room for customization when you take that approach. Now I like to, 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 to split it into two camps, hydration. And typically I have our runners on um, water and salt supplementation for that. And that's very, very important in Singapore because it's just so damn hot and humid. But even in New Zealand, if I, if I was going to run a marathon, I'd be on um, primarily water and salt supplementation. Yeah, and um, Ellie, she was my nutritionist, and she always told me just a pinch of salt. It's just a pinch of salt. doesn't need too much. But, yeah, always had me doing that with water. Yeah, It's pretty interesting, actually, man. Like one of the latest tests we've got in our, in our lab is now a, a sweat test, and it, um, it determines how much um, salt you lose in, in your sweat. And we've only had it a few months, but so far we've seen it vary from as, as little as sort of 400 milligrams per liter of sweat all the way up to over 2000 milligrams per liter of sweat. So that's a pretty big um, range. Um, and if you're a person who's losing like 2000 milligrams, um, you'd need to be on some pretty heavy um, sodium, su sodium supplementation to uh, avoid cramping and, and, and dehydrating. So, it's kind of interesting, but anyway, um, and if you guys want to check that stuff, by the way, there's a great, um, a great calculator, uh, on the precision hydration website. So I think it's precisionhydration.com. It's free. You just go online, um, plug in answers to their questions and it will generate, um, sort of a, a hydration strategy for you. Um, by splitting hydration and calories, so calories come from gels or yeah, that's where I take them from anyway. I take it from gels. You, you give yourself a little bit more room for customization because, for example, um, you know, as you run through the race, your, your calorie demand is going to be pretty consistent, right? You're burning your fuel. You need to replace it. But, for example, in the morning when it's cooler, you may not need as much hydration. And so, and when it's hotter in the, later in the day, you might need more hydration, right? So when you split them, it allows you to, to basically get what you need, but to do it in a way that doesn't leave you feeling bloated and potentially sick. Because if it's cool in the morning, um, you're still going to need a certain amount of calories. But if you have to drink a lot to get those calories, then you're filling your tummy up um, with liquid that potentially you don't need. 
And so in my experience working with the athletes um, who I work closely with here and, and by splitting the calories and the hydration, uh, we've been able to, to really dial in a, a nutritional strategy that is working really well and that they, they don't feel bloated, they don't need to pee, they you know, aren't getting cramped and these types of things. So it's definitely a, a work in progress. Um, but again, nutrition is one of these things that we have complete control over and just like equipment, um, the number one rule is, is don't use anything new on race day because I've seen so many times where people have had a sports drink that they're not familiar with and ended up with stitch or cramping or whatever. And it's just a real shame, yeah. especially if you have been training hard and you, you let something as silly as this um, ruin it. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Cool, man. So I think um, that gives everyone a pretty good idea of what they need to do. Um, if, if you have any questions, please post them in now because we're going to wrap this up pretty shortly. Um, if not, I want to thank you for joining us. And thank you too, Tony, for showing up. Um, yes, sorry. <laughs> as, as I mentioned at the beginning, right, if you guys are interested in, in trying out the coach program after you get through next weekend, um, use code DODSY, D-O-D-D-S-Y, when signing up. And instead of a two-week free trial, you get a six-week free trial. So that should give you a good, um, nice structured program, It'll give you access to Tony and myself to answer all your questions and to, to get your training in a way that we believe will improve your performance, but do so in a way that's healthy and um, sustainable. So yeah, I know how hard it is for, like, you know, just talking with people like Kiwis especially. We are – we do <laughs> – this is what we're trying to get across to, to New Zealanders to be able to train, um, you know, to enjoy the train, to be able to train by heart rate and to go easier during training to be able to go faster in racing. And still Kiwi's not quite getting that, you know, we want to go out and we want to smash ourselves because it feels good. Um, so what we're trying to do is to be able to, you know, educate you on, on training a little bit easier and training at your, your training zones, at your intensities um, by using heart rate. Um, or do your training zones, your easy, steadily, steady, moderately hard, hard, and very hard, using those five zones to be able to train. So we just want to educate you and, and onto how to train. So I know you want to go out there and smash it, but trust me, if you, you know, to hold back just a little bit in training, you know, it goes very far. So, you know, if you want to try it, then yeah, please do yeah. sign up. We'll be looking over it. Yeah. For sure. It's a, it's a very counterintuitive thing to think that if you slow down in training, you'll race faster. But given the way it works and being that a marathon is primarily an aerobic sport, around 99% of the energy is coming from your aerobic system, making sure that that system is strong is damn important. And the goal is not to run faster by pushing harder because that has a, a, a limited um, capacity. The goal is to become more efficient so that at the same or lower heart rate, you're able to run faster. Yeah. And um, um, yeah, you, know, you know, I think most of you should know John Hallimans, um, Andrea Hewitt, Chris Kimmel, um, the late Laurent Vidal. Um, they were the easiest trainers I've ever met. Richard Murray, who's, a, who's, who's one of the top um, uh, Olympic triathletes, you know, the easiest trainers but when they wanted to go fast, they could go really fast. And I mean, they didn't show it in training, but by geez, once it come to racing, you know, they were really fast. So they all trained easy. Um, Arthur Lydia, you know, they were all very training easy as well. Long mileage, of course, but yeah. For sure, man, because the whole idea is like when you, and I'm a good example of this, mate, because back when I was fit, like you training full time, in zone, at my zone one ceiling, I could run at low four minutes per K, like four, mm -hmm. 4.15 to 4.30, depending on weather and how tired I was and whatnot. Um, fast forward 10 years now, and I'm, I'm no longer in that situation. I've got a pretty busy job and two twins and, you know, like lots going on. And at the same heart rate, I'm still the same dude. I can only run it, like, unfortunately, about 5.40 per K. <laughs> now, now, the, the effort hasn't changed. It's just that because I'm no longer as aerobically fit, I can't produce the same output. And so if my goal was to go and run a fast marathon again, I wouldn't be going down to the track and smacking myself with a whole bunch of intervals. I'd be going out and running a lot of easy hills to lay down that foundation to build some strength. And that 540 pace at my easy heart rate would become 530. 
5.20, 5.10, five minutes. And after a year, I'd be back down, I don't know, in the fours. Um, so that's the goal. The goal is to not push harder to achieve more pace, but to become more efficient so that at the same or lower heart rate, you run faster. And I think that that's an important lesson that everyone down in New Zealand needs to learn. And that's how I spend a good chunk of my time up here in Singapore, because all runners, for the most part, um, have a very hard time getting their head around that and getting their ego under control. Oh, yeah, that's a hard one. <laughs> so if you are interested in learning more about our philosophies and how we do this, Dodds and I get together a blog every second Tuesday and we post it up. The one coming out next Tuesday is about mileage. It's titled Why Mileage is Important but Not That Important. Um, our last blog last Tuesday was um, a blog called Consistency is the Ultimate Performance Enhancer. And I encourage you guys to, to read these. We put a lot of... Um, thought into these and they're usually the result of common questions we're asked and like i said our, our approach is very much an evidence-based approach having worked with like we've literally done thousands of lactate tests thousands of metabolic tests um been to hundreds of races and cross-checked everything and tested everything and before and afters and we're pretty confident that we've put together a program that is sound and will work for most people most of the time and we're not cocky enough to say that it will work for everybody but we will try hard to um, make changes and to, to tweak things for the people that are outliers and maybe it doesn't work for the first go through so thank you so much for joining us um, like us on facebook facebook.com slash coached um, we're constantly posting up things there and and, and really trying hard to, to teach people how to train better uh, and to maximize the time they spend. Um, read the blog. If you are keen on trying the program, coached.fitness. Um, we have a running and a triathlon program. Use Dodzy when signing up and you will get six weeks of free trial. Um, and I wish you all the best for, for next weekend's race. I hope it goes awesome. And I hope you'll let us know how it goes. Just drop an email, hello at coach.fitness. Let us know how it goes. Um, we'll be very eager to hear. And just remember, the takeaway from today's talk is control what you can control. All right? That's your mindset, your equipment, your pacing, your running form, and your nutrition. If you think about those things and you, you really do your best to, to execute those well, you'll maximize your fitness. You'll have a good experience. You'll have a good outcome. And hopefully you'll recover faster and be king to get started on your next challenge, whatever that might be. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. If you, and even in, in the next week, um, I know things start to get a little bit more emotional or things start to come up and you need to ask some quick questions on what to do or how to, um, how to do something different. Just email us. Um, and Hello we'll coach. Get on to fitness. Hello at coach. Fitness. Yeah. Awesome stuff, guys. Hey, thanks for joining us. We're going to wrap it up and um, have an awesome race. We'll see you soon.